Awesome. Uh, so before I start, I just want to take a quick poll of the audience to um, try to gauge what level of technical or you know um, or whatever discussion I want to have. So uh, maybe show of hands, uh, who in this room is a product manager or an aspiring product manager? Okay. Uh, developer. Uh, data scientist. Okay. And and who finally, m most importantly, uh, who here has seen the movie Office Space? Oh, okay, great, great. So I won't have to explain too much. Um, so, um, so my motivation for coming in and doing this talk was really, you know, I've been building AI-driven products for the last five years, and there's one thing I learned, um, they're really hard. Uh, and now, every, almost every product now has, you know, is using AI or machine learning or AR, uh, augmented reality. So uh, I wanna make sure that I think that the same kind of evolution in a product management community, I feel like hasn't taken place. Um, so hopefully this talk will give uh, both the product managers and also those of you who are fulfilling that function within your respective teams um, think about it uh, a little bit differently. Uh, so first of all, um, my background. In 2013, um, my co-founder Max and I started uh, a company called DocMunch at the time. Uh, we built a algorithm that would uh, extract tables from PDF files. So you would upload a PDF file, it would scan through it, identify any tabular data structures, and extract them out while retaining the structural characteristics of the table. So the columns, the rows, and so forth. Uh, we sold that to banks. Uh, along the way, discovered that selling to banks is really hard. Uh, like literally, from proof of concept to getting paid was a year and a half. Um, so we changed the product to something that analyzed documents um, and specifically showed them as web pages, which allowed us to uh, use JavaScript to track how long people were reading each page, what things they clicked on, and allowed us to deliver an application from, to marketers that gave them more insight into their eBooks and white papers. Um, that led to us getting acquired by a company called Nitro, where I worked with Alexi, uh, where Alexi was chief scientist. And um, Nitro, at Nitro, we wanted to build the future of smart documents. The theory being that documents are these inanimate objects that we use day, day to day, but they don't really make us more productive. So by doing things like detecting where the form fields are, uh, by changing the format so that they refit a uh, mobile phone, or by extracting names of people, places, um, and dates, uh, we could make them more powerful. So sounds pretty good, right? Um, have, have some experience doing this. This is the real title of my talk. Um, in five years, I built three products, of three, you know, three, three companies. Um, the table extractor, it was like 80% accurate. So it was unreliable such that you couldn't just upload a document and just have it automatically detect tables. Uh, people were really using it as a first pass uh, before working with their information in Excel. Uh, the document analytics tool, we had hundreds of thousands of read sessions. So people who read documents, um, but you know, that data was really noisy and we couldn't really make sense of it. And we couldn't deliver to our customers what they really wanted, which was to figure out which parts of the content really worked and, which, um, and what could keep their customers to, to read more of their documents and engage more. And finally, in Nitro, um, you know, we built an awesome form field detection prototype and a really cool thing that would um, convert your PDF and so you could re like reflow it for mobile device, even if it's like two columns and it was like, a, a, even though it was a fixed layout. But ultimately, by the time we left, uh, nothing had gotten prototyped, uh, product uh, productionized to a point where a paid customer was using it. So, you know, in my book, if you're, if you're not, you know, succeeding, you're, you're failing. Um, and so I still consider them failures, um, even though I learned a lot from them. So hopefully I can take in some of those lessons and, and um, help you guys avoid some of the mistakes I made. Uh, so today, uh, three things I wanted to talk about. First is that why someone needs to wear the PM hat, why the role of a product manager uh, in, a, in a data science team or someone, a team that's building AI products is even more essential than ever, um, why the traditional product management process isn't a great fit for AI, and, and finally, um, four habits that I think that effective AI managers should have. Um, I know I should have seven, but you know, maybe, a, maybe the next version will have seven. Um, so someone needs to wear the PM hat. The reason I think this is true is because if you look at kind of like where the data science uh, community is today, 
it bears a lot of characteristics of an academic mentality. Um, and the academic mentality is one where you have explicit problem statements, well-structured data, and well-defined success criteria. So if you look at the first one here, this competition uh, on Kaggle, which is the uh, basically predicting, the question, the question they want to try to answer is, can you, can you provide, provide a better way to predict and estimate home prices? Um, there's, a lot, there's, a, there's a structured data set that they provide you, which are all this, the homes that have been sold, all their features, like number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, so forth, where they're located, and the actual price that they were sold for. Uh, and the, the, the success criteria is easy to figure out. It's the difference between the predicted value and the actual value. And that makes your job as a, as a research engineer or a data scientist you know, pretty straightforward. The, the goal is also um, very clear. It's to publish a research paper that um, improves upon the traditional benchmarks. The gold standard for this is the ImageNet paper uh, in 2012, which showed that convolutional neural networks um, could you know, vastly exceed the traditional benchmarks in the image classification task. Uh, most other papers are, you know, their, their improvements are much more incremental, but that's still kind of like the model uh, in academia. Now, in the real world, it's a little bit different. Um, it's more like this. You know, your manager comes to you, and he's like, I want you to explore the data. You know, <laughs> explore it. And then, you know, afterwards, you know, let's get some insights to our customers. Um, and then he walks away. L literally, I'm, I'm not joking, this is exactly what happens uh, in the real world. And you're like, what, is explore, what does explore mean? You know, what, what insights are we talking about here? Uh, and the problem is that a lot of people who aren't technical, they think that AI is like this fairy dust you sprinkle on top of data. You know? And you keep sprinkling, these insights will shoot forth like magical rainbows. Pew, pew. And, and, yeah, and unicorns as well. And, and that's just not how it works, right? Um, and, and so as a product manager, you're responsible for owning the following questions. What problem are we solving? Why is it valuable? Do we have relevant data that's actually, you know, can, might possibly answer this question? Um, how are we going to measure success? And most importantly, how do we actually build a system that learns? Um, and this is why I think Product managers are you know, incredibly important in, in AI. Um, this, this is probably one of the most famous quotes from, uh, from Office Space, um, but there's a grain of truth in it, you know, because essentially a product manager connects the people who understand the customers, salespeople, executives, the customers themselves, with the people who are gonna build something that solves their problem, the data scientists and engineers. Unfortunately, right now in AI, this gulf between the customer people and the technical people is extremely wide. And that's why as product managers, we have to understand both sides in order to bridge that gap effectively. Finally, um, most teams don't have a product manager right now. Um, so if there's no PM, uh, the lead of the team, you're the one wearing the PM hat. And it's your job to answer uh, these questions. So let me move on and kind of explain why I think the traditional PM process is not a good fit for how AI-based products should be built. Um, so the, the, the traditional process is really more of a problem-solution, um, kind of like split. And um, so it, it may be waterfall, it may be agile, Kanban, or scrum, but, but the unit economics of product management are all pretty much the same. Uh, you start with talking to users and gathering their stories, finding out what their pain points are, um, then you define the requirements um, you know, for what you want to build and how to measure that. Um, then you work with UI and US designers to develop mock-ups for what your feature or product might look like. Uh, and after it's built, you perform acceptance testing to see if it matched the mock-ups and if it actually uh, met the requirements you set forth. So to, to kind of illustrate why I think this is, where this works and where this doesn't, um, let's, let's use an example of a product uh, that, can I, that, that we'll use throughout the rest of this presentation. And the, the, the product I chose was, is a product called Delve. Uh, it's basically Netflix for documents. So just like Netflix personalized, personalizes recommendations of movies for you based on your preferences, uh, Delve basically does the same thing, but with Office documents. You know, 
not as exciting, obviously, but, uh, but useful you know, if you think about you know, a large organization where lots of people have lots of documents. Uh, it'll be great to know kind of what your colleagues have shared publicly if it's relevant to you. So a traditional product management process would be solving a problem like this. Hey, users are not using our product, right? A very common problem. Pretty much every product has you know, some form of this problem. And um, maybe you talk to users and you realize, well, that's because you know, they don't know um, what the product's all about. So let's build a, a tour. Uh, you know, so the, the first thing you see when you start using the product is a tour that shows you, you know, what you can do with the product. A traditional PM process, this is a good fit for a traditional PM process because you can say, the story is, as a new user, I wanna know what the top three features are so I can start using the product. And the requirements are maybe are, you can show a carousel uh, with the features, uh, the user can exit at any time so you don't um, piss them off, and it works well on mobile. Uh, so you work with designers, you get the mock-up, and afterwards, you know, you assess, did the requirements pass? Uh, if so, then you're basically done. Um, so anyone who's seen Office Space, this is seen after they smash the printers in the field, and they're, you know, they're very happy because they destroyed some relic of old technology. Um, now, but here's a problem. Let's say you still have the same problem you had before. Users still aren't using the product. So you go talk to the users and you say, you know, so what's going on? And they say, well, honestly, these recommendations are pretty bad. Like, they're just not relevant to what I, you know, what, what I want to see. I don't, like, these documents are, have completely no relationship to what I care about. And so maybe now you want to improve the relevance of the recommended content. And this is where I think um, product managers struggle a little bit because, um, you know, we're very resourceful. Uh, we can, you know, kind of, you know, we, we want to, we, we solve things, but the traditional kind of like problem, define problem, create solution type of um, approach uh, isn't a good fit. And like, let me illustrate that by actually using a traditional PM process to try to solve this problem. So uh, maybe you talk to one user, that user says, well, you know, as a user, I want to see content um, produced by people that I care about, right? So the requirement is, well, okay, let's out overweigh the documents shared by the people who are in the same office as the user. So you add a rule to your algorithm basically expressing that. You talk to another, another user and that person says, well, I wanna see content that's related to my job. So um, you may uh, you know, add another rule to your algorithm that overweighs documents shared by people in the same functional department. And finally, uh, a third user says, well, I wanna see information around social events because I'm a party animal. And so uh, maybe you add a, yet another rule that overweights documents that are shared by people on the social planning committee. So I hope you see where I'm going with this because um, what these incremental marginal rules lead to is a bunch of heuristics, okay? And basically, you know if you're in this area, um, if you have this problem, if like your model basically is a, is a nested series of if-then statements uh, where you're essentially weighting these different factors back and forth um, and your model is like this gigantic block of spaghetti code. And the problem with that um, is it's not a system that learns. By adding more data, you're not, you don't have a, a, um, like a, a way to actually you don't, know, you don't know that more data is gonna improve accuracy. Um, moreover, the more you tweak these algorithms, so let's say you change one weight here, um, you know, that, it becomes a zero sum game because you um, are essentially you know, uh, pushing the model in one direction at the expense of another one. Um, and so if it's not a system that learns, it's not AI, full stop. Um, and this is, a, this is usually, I think a lot of people start with this because they, you know, um, really that's all they have. But I think if you actually understood kind of like, you know, some basis of machine learning and AI, um, you can do a much better job. And so let me tell you about kind of like what I think is a better framework for dealing with this. Uh, and I have like four, basically four things that um, AI product managers should be doing. Number one, um, you need to understand the model. Uh, 
there's a lot of content now uh, about machine learning um, on Coursera, Udacity. There's a course called Fast.ai, which I loved. Uh, and frankly, it's not very difficult for someone who has a basic um, you know, university level math background to understand machine learning. And if you don't do that, it's really hard to make progress um, as a product manager building AI products. So uh, let me walk through an example uh, using kind of like that Netflix with documents example. Um, can, can I see another show of hands? Who here is familiar with collaborative filtering? Okay, great. Uh, so about you know a third to half the room. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, if you really want to know how it works, just Google it. Uh, a lot of info out there. Uh, essentially, collaborative filtering is a uh, is a is a recommendation algorithm that uh, takes ratings of you know things that people submit, um, and then uses that as the training data to predict ratings which have not been seen yet. Um, so, and the, the key to doing this is that you're, you construct essentially a vectors of latent factors. So think of like these hidden preferences that may drive a lot of the decisions we make, but we don't know exactly what those factors are. And the, the model essentially tries to, tries to um, predict uh, based on these latent factors and then um, you know, and train based on the error between the training data and the predicted uh, ratings. So. Um, Case in point, let's, um, let's take a kind of ratings. Uh, let's say that there's three types of ratings you can give. Uh, there's two, which is indicates very strong interest, one, which is lukewarm, and zero, which means no interest. Um, and if the cell is blank, it means that, um, is that uh, the, the, uh, the, the person hasn't rated at all. So um, in this example, let's say based on this, this matrix, um, what do you guys think the, the rating that user three would give to document three would be? Any guesses? Um, raise your hand if you think it's gonna be a zero, which means no interest. Uh, one? Okay. Uh, two? Okay. Yeah, so it's probably one or two, somewhere near there, but um, the, the, the point is more like, is, is we can actually do a systematic job of predicting this. And the way we do that is, um, essentially, let's say we have four latent factors. These factors may be things like you know, proximity or uh, released by the social committee, um, but more likely they're, um, they're an amalgam of all these different components. Usually there's no one characteristic, but uh, by multiplying, taking the dot product of the user, vec what the user vector and the document vector, we can basically predict what that uh, rating is. And by doing so, we essentially have two matrices. We have the trading matrix, and we have the prediction matrix. And when we have these two sets of data, we can essentially uh, compute the error. So uh, just, uh, essentially this, the sum of squared loss minimize that error um, by changing the latent factors, and therefore um, that gives us a model to basically make this better. Um, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of details, but I'm hopeful that you know, maybe if you're interested you can Google cloud filtering after this and learn about it. But the one key part here is that the more training data you have, the better your predictions will be because you'll be able to check your predictions versus the training data. Um, and finally, when you make the prediction, you know, I, it's a, the prediction is probably a very simple algorithm like show the user the top rated documents that he or she does not own. And based on that, then you can do more things. So the, the second thing that I think all AI product managers need to do is, number one, is get labeled data. Because labeled data is what really drives um, you know, th these models. And so some of you have probably heard the cliche, uh, data is new oil. Um, so I, I think this is actually uh, wrong. I think the, the really it should say labeled data is a new oil, uh, and also unlabeled data uh, is the new dirt. <laughs> So label data are basically data which has explicit labels of exactly what you're trying to predict. Um, example, you know, things that are not label data are server logs, satellite images, and files in S3, a storage system. Um, what is labeled data would be server logs where you also indicate which ones came from a malicious IP if you're predicting uh, you know, where the hackers are coming from. Uh, so Another one is satellite images uh, with markers of pools if you're creating a pool detector. Um, 
by the, which by the way is, you might think, why, why would you want to do that? Uh, insurance companies find that really valuable because um, pools are uh, a big indicator of risk. And finally, uh, files and S3, um, if, you, if they were marked which ones are confidential and which ones are not confidential, that allows you to create a confidentiality classifier. Um, now, getting labeled data uh, is probably one of the biggest challenges that a, a, a product or data science team needs to solve. So um, a few ways to do that. Uh, the, the most common way is something called transfer learning, where you take pre-trained models from another domain, uh, and then you may add a little bit of labeled data at the very end to fine tune it in order to improve on an existing algorithm. This works really well in computer vision. So if, if, if I mean, we've seen things like the, um, there's a cucumber farmer who basically built a computer vision system that, that detected cucumbers and non-cucumbers. Um, he basically just used a pre-trained ImageNet model to do that. Uh, the, the Silicon Valley episode recently about kind of like the, where someone built a hot dog or not hot dog classifier. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can just take pure ImageNet and get to like an 80% accuracy uh, just on ImageNet alone without any additional data. Um, another one is outsource labeling. Uh, Cloudflower and um, Mechanical Turk are the two most popular. This is where you hire uh, people to label your data for you. Um, finally, uh, well, in, in addition, I think brute force is always an option. Um, anecdotally, I've heard that a lot of what Google has put out in terms of ML was built on the back of a lot of individual Google employees who spend a lot of time labeling data. Um, you know, and the, the rule of thumb I always use is how long would it take you to get to 10,000 samples in your training set? Um, more often than not, it's actually less than you would think uh, because you know, if it's like 30 seconds per training example and you spend a few days on it, you're gonna get there. Uh, and that sometimes that is the best way to uh, get the data if, if, it's, you know, if you don't have it already. Um, but sometimes none of these three really works and, and, um, and that's when user feedback becomes your only option. Um, this is most, uh, most common when you're working with sensitive enterprise data where privacy issues prevent you from outsourcing it or brute forcing it or where it's something that is personalized, uh, where you wanna personalize the output of something for, typical, for a particular person uh, and therefore, you know, training kind of, you know, training, if you only have one person that it's trained on, it doesn't extrapolate onto other, other people. And this is why I think um, uh, the third thing is really important in terms of an AI product manager, which is you, know, you have to construct a feedback loop. So the feedback loop works something like this. You display predictions, uh, you collect user feedback, you add that feedback back into your training set, and then you refit the model. Um, I think the one um, thing that I would just maybe, uh, if you're gonna do this is, uh, make sure your feedback is structured in the same dimensions as uh, your training data. And if it's not structured in that way, uh, transform it such that it, such that it is. So in the example of the Netflix for Documents application, um, maybe one way that you can turn that feedback into uh, your training data is for every document shown, um, you wanna assign it a rating of one, two, or zero. Uh, so maybe one is if the person clicks on the document and opens it once. Uh, if it's two if the user is opening that document for a second or a third time. And zero is if the document has been shown to the user more than three times and the person doesn't click on it at all. And so, as an example, uh, in this case, let's say the, the, the person clicked on the document in the top left. Um, the first time they click on it, uh, you look at your training matrix, you plug a one into the blank that there was that, uh, the blank area that was there before. If the person clicks on it again, you turn that one into a two. Uh, and, and I think you wanna have that feedback loop in place on day one. And the reason you wanna do that is because um, you're essentially collecting labeled data. Labeled data is what fuels um, you know, AI-based algorithms. And uh, if you don't have that feedback loop in day one, you're basically wasting that data. Um, finally, I think it's important to measure performance in relative and not 
absolute terms. And that's because the first version that you ship will probably suck. Uh, lots of examples of this out there. Uh, this is a Twitter feed I found called Bad Netflix Recommendations. So it's like, you know, if you want, if you like the movie Something Borrowed, you're going to like Taken. Um, you know, uh, so I actually think this is a, I'm pretty sure this is a joke account uh, because, you know, if they are using collaborative filtering and they're using it based on latent factors, the titles of the documents shouldn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> uh, but I, I still think it's funny. Um, uh, another one is Siri. Siri, you know, when it was launched, was pretty bad. Um, you can argue it's still pretty bad, you know. Uh, and finally, who can, you know, we all, I think we're all familiar with this Tay chatbot that Microsoft produced. Um, which, you know, it was, it was trained into something that I think they did not envision on its very first day. Um, and, and, and so I think the, the reason why you want to assess relative performance is because you want to figure out how much data you need to get, a good, get to good enough. Um, and most importantly, you want to set expectations. So when your manager basically, you know, or your VP or whoever says, hey, how's it, how's it looking? Um, and they don't measure how good the product or the, the algorithm is when you launch it um, because it's probably not going to be very good. But if you can say, yes, it's not very good now, but here's how much data we, can, we need to get to that good enough state, then it's easier to make an informed business decision as to whether to continue the product or to kill it. Uh, so illustrating that in graphical terms, um, you know, with more data, the accuracy of your model will improve. The slope is your relative performance. Um, if there's a line that says good enough, then um, essentially you know, the, the intersect is how much data you need to get there. Um, so you know, just putting that together, um, you know, here's my four habits. Uh, first, you have to understand the model because that's really the core of AI. The second is you need to have a strategy for collecting labeled data. Third is um, have a feedback loop on day one that points back into your label data. And number four, um, measure performance on relative terms and set expectations based on that. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, we over here. Yep. When the AI will be able to help product managers create products? Uh, you mean when will AI help? Uh, well, I think you need a lot of labeled data. Um, That's interesting. You know, because I, I, I think that I, I think there's, there's my experience so far is that AI works well in um, where your data your data samples are homogenous, right? So when you have when you, when when data point A looks pretty similar to data point B to data point C, and you have a good amount of them. And so the, the, I think when you think about, when you think about like kind of like product creation, um, there's every product, you know, every, the process of creating every product looks pretty different from one another. And so I think in order to, the first step before you can start applying clinical AI to that process is a way of standardizing across these different product formulation processes so you can apply some type of probabilistic process to it. Yeah. Okay. So how do you avoid the power of all terms? You, you, you talked about a feedback loop, and you know, I appreciate everything I think is relevant here, but, but it, it, you're still exposing the model to a bias uh, in, in effect, the uh, power rule. The more people that select it, the, the, those are the ones mm. that ever get displayed. So maybe the ones that are, could be relevant for the long tail group. Right. Never get exposed, so you yep. disable yep. that, yep. that yep. rich search capability. So how do you mitigate that? Yeah, so th there's, there's there's a lot of research into that. Um, I, I didn't want to get into exactly kind of like how collab where collaborative filtering doesn't work, and that's exactly one of the areas that doesn't work. Uh, another one is just bootstarting them from scratch because you kind of have this cold start problem. Um, so to be honest, I think both Delve as well as Netflix have moved way beyond collaborative filtering as a way to provide the best recommendations um, to people. Um, but, uh, and I think, I think what, I, what I was trying to do here was more illustrate kind of the need for a non-technical person to understand the basics of the model um, in order to 
um, kind of like make progress. But I agree with you that you know if if you if you if the, even if the model is relatively complex, I think you need to understand kind of where where it falls down and where it works well in order to um, make the effective decisions you, you need to make. Over here. On the slide that talks about the, um, the active performance curve mm -hmm. or the activity curve. Uh, so you, you have a lot, you drew a line for good enough, uh, enough data. Right. How was that uh, position on the amount of data actually selected? Did it look like its own collection? Was it because of the performance curve? Or oh, no, yeah. The, 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 yeah, this really depends on what you're trying to predict. Um, so, so usually, there, usually, I think it's easier to get to know that up front because usually it's, a, it's, it's framed as a percentage accuracy level. So, for example, when we were doing table detection, um, we 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 estimated we needed to be something around 97% accurate uh, based on like the types of tables we were pulling out and what people were doing with them. So, I think with any type of exercise like this, usually there's some type of Benchmark you think you want to hit, uh, where people will, will it truly becomes useful to them, and where it becomes automatic enough. This also, this also, uh, interestingly enough, depends on if you're doing a confirmation model or a recommendation model. So a confirmation model is one where the user assumes that it's you know it's it's, it's good, and they don't need to take action. Uh, they only need to take action to correct it. The other model is a recommendation model where um, you know you present three choices to the user. And the user picks uh, one of them. So, um, if you know, the, the the confirmation model is, let's say, one where it's you know you're checking where table detection. I think is a more of a confirmation model. Um, if you're if you're uploading a PDF with like with 30 tables in it, um, you don't want to go through and check every single one afterwards. Um, whereas a, a recommendation model is something like um, Smart Reply in Google, where it recommends a reply to a particular email. And so the user can pick one of the three or none at all. And so, like whether it's confirmation or recommendation affects what good enough means to your algorithm. Um, okay, yeah, one more. So you, you focus a lot on label data. Are there any interesting use cases for unsupervised learning on label data? Yeah, I'm glad you said that actually, because I, I think I think that one of the things that um, you know one of the reasons people do say you know data the new oil is because there is this two there's two schools of um, ML, there's supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, there's definitely a use case for unsupervised. Uh, in, in, in business terms, I found it more useful to um, sort of like indicate where to point your, um, where, to, where to supervise. So as an initial first cut, uh, when you're exploring data to see you know, um, which, which features you want to use uh, or uh, what types of labels you want to collect. Um, it also helps a lot in visualization, uh, so like the, the cluster charts that, that Mark showed earlier, um, and to kind of communicate like the, the like what data sets look at at large. Um, but the, the reason that supervised learning is pretty much um, is most of what's been released today in terms of um, you know real business products. Um, it primarily is because usually in order to, to produce business value, uh, you're trying to predict or classify something. Uh, whereas unsupervised, you know, if you don't have kind of like a direction that you can point the algorithm toward, it's hard to iterate toward something. Uh, usually, it's the the first the first cut isn't gonna really be good enough, and you're gonna work on this model and the data set for a good period of time before it becomes valuable. So supervised essentially gives you a goalpost to do that. This one? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. What's the difference between AI and machine learning? Right. Um, yeah, honestly, to me, in my opinion, uh, zero. Um, I, I think that, I think that the, frankly, I think the, we're still looking for the right terminology here. Um, you know, the, the, there is a school of thought that AI is sort of like in, in, encapsulates ML. Uh, machine learning and robotics and, and augmented reality and so forth, um, deep learning as well. Uh, and I, I think that they're all kind of like somewhat related. Um, but uh, when, I, when I think of AI, I, I really think of um, algorithms that can make decisions without being explicitly programmed. 
So no if then statements, like nothing that says if A then do B, is something that can um, basically make decisions and the more data you give it, the better decisions it makes. Yeah, that's true as well. Yeah. Maybe if I made one more, uh, since you worked on document relevance, I'm just curious, I can be running one of the fundamental problem I think, let's say, in that way, and use time spent as easily as, say, to sell in productivity problems. That, that, that's not a good I mean, I don't know if that's my time. Right. I, I just want to figure out how, how do you write that problem or what kind of yeah, problems yeah. communicated Yeah, so, um, I, I, I think for I think for um, for these type of applications where you want to measure kind of like uh, time spent, um, you're right. Productivity is a um, you know you don't want to measure you want to say if I spend more time on this than not, um, but but I think that time spent does indicate interest uh, because m most of the things we find out there like you know we only see a small subset of you know what we can, what we can choose from. So I think one of the things that that's why I use times clicked as kind of like the, what I think the benchmark should be because, you know, um, a large organization produces millions and millions of documents. And, you know, if I, you know, indicate preference for one over the multitude out there that's available, that's some indica indication of interest. Um, but I think the amount of time I spend reading that document probably isn't a great proxy for how good or how uh, interesting that subject is. Yep. And great presentation, by the way. Thank you for coming today. No problem. Uh, are you talking about this one right here? This one? That one. Okay. Yeah, I got to speak uh, with Devin the other night. Oh, cool. And, cool. Uh, awesome that you continued the. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much.